Hi, BookTube. I'm back today with my March wrap-up and my April TBR. I read 22 books in March. I did not stick super closely to my actual TBR list. I had the nasty, nasty stomach bug at the end of March. I had about a week where I really didn't want to concentrate on anything. I felt miserable. I had four days where I was just in bed or on the couch feeling wretched. And then I had a bunch of other days in there where I was just kind of like staggering through my day, accomplishing tasks, but really not up for anything. With the result that I sort of abandoned the end of my actual TBR and reread murder mysteries. So what can you do? But hey, I've got kind of a long wrap up for you. So let's just get started. I'm going to do this by genre, so let's just start with the murder mysteries. I read six murder mysteries um, during the month of March, and unfortunately, well, maybe not unfortunately, uh, three of them are, were rereads. I, as everybody knows, I'm very fond of Bernie Sayers, and when I am sick in bed, unable to concentrate on anything, what more could I ever want to do besides reread Dorothy Sayers? So I reread um, Have His Carcass. And then both Gaudy Night and Westman's Honeymoon, which I have bound up together here. Um, I actually read them in ebook because this was this big bind up was just kind of too much for me. Um, I've talked so much about Dorothy Sayers elsewhere, but Gaudy Night is probably my favorite one of hers, and so it was a lot of fun to do. And I hadn't reread Have His Carcass for a while, so it was great. Sorry for the noises in the next room. Arthur's playing like he does while I make these videos, and he gets very enthusiastic. Then I read two more ebooks. These are by Jill Patton Walsh, and Jill Patton Walsh um, kind of took up the characters in Dorothy Sayers' short stories after Dorothy Sayers died. I'm a little resistant always to reading those sorts of continuations. She's written four, and I read the first two, and then I said no. I don't want to ruin the characters for myself reading her, writing them, and then I just decided to read them anyway. Um, and these were actually better than the first two that I read. The first two, I think it's Thrones, Dominations, and then Presumption of Death. Um, and I really disliked Presumption of Death, and that was when I stopped reading. But anyway, the next two are the Attenbury Emeralds and the Late Scholar, and these were both a lot of fun, especially the Late Scholar, which is a mystery totally centered around another book. And then last in the mystery category, I read um, Walter Mosley's Devil in a Blue Dress. This was fun, too. Um, I didn't adore it, but it was definitely fun. It's more of the in the hard-boiled genre, which is not one that I usually read, although one of my viewers did correct me and said that technically uh, hard-boiled can be considered a subset of Golden Age. Um, this one, this one couldn't be. This one was written more recently. But anyway, not what I usually read, but still really fun. It's set in, in L.A. in the 1940s, 1950s. And the sleuth, Easy Rollins, is a World War II veteran. Back home from the war, uh, war he's a black man trying to make it in the 1940s, which um, was not always easy. And he gets drawn, this is the first one, and he just gets drawn into this mystery more or less to save his skin, and then discovers that he's very good at being a detective. I also read six books of nonfiction this month. I'll start with the ones that I read as ebook. Um, I read, oh, you know, so my father-in-law um, is a volunteer at his local library, and when they got rid of the card catalog, he took all of the old cards home. And so now we have boxes and boxes of these old card catalog cards at home, which we use for everything, like grocery lists and bookmarks and notes to each other. So all of my ebooks have been writing on these old card catalog cards. Um, if you can think of any other creative uses for me, for me for, with these old cards, I would love to hear about them because we literally have boxes and boxes full. The entire car, old card catalog of this library in Maine we own. Anyway, back to the point. First I read um, All Who Go Do Not Return by Shalem Dean. This just came out. It's by Grey Wolf Press, or put out by Grey Wolf, Wolf Press, and it's about his boyhood in Hasidic Judaism and how he lost faith. Um, Hasidic Judaism is something that's always interested me since I read The Chosen back in high school. And it was so interesting to read this thoughtful memoir about leaving the religion. I can't say that I thought the book was super mind-blowing, but I did really enjoy it. And it was fun to read something so hot off the press. I had pre-ordered it as an ebook, and so I think I read it the day it came out. Um, then I read Darkness Visible by William Styron. I'd been wanting to read this one for a while. Um, this is his classic memoir about depression. I hadn't realized how short it was. In real page numbers, it's only about 80 pages. It was a really fast read. 
um, because of its because of how short it was. However, there was just a lot there. It was dense. It was thoughtful, and given the subject matter, it was certainly not a light read. But William Styron is a gorgeous writer, and I actually hadn't read anything by him before. Um, so that was a great way to start with him, and I loved his perspective. Now I sort of want to move on and read um, other books about depression. I know there was a really good one that came out recently by Andrew Solomon, so I think that might be on my TBR list coming up in the next few months. I read Atal Gawande's Being Mortal. Um, this one has been on a ton of like best of 2014 lists. I've read a ton about death and dying, and so I was worried that this one would seem too repetitive to me. Um, but it wasn't. I mean, it was a little bit, but I didn't mind. I should have known that I wouldn't mind because um, death and dying is one of my favorite topics. I was um, a hospice nurse for a while before I became a nurse practitioner, and it's something I would love to get back into. Okay, this was just really lovely. I'm really tempted in the future to make a whole video about books on death and dying, and then I might talk more about this book and more about other books and where to start about reading about end-of-life issues. Um, so perhaps wait to hear more about it then. This was a great read. It was pretty fast. And for somebody that's just starting to read about the, these issues, I don't think it would be too intimidating. It's not gruesome or anything like that. Then I read The Psychopath Test by John Ronson. This was a buddy read with one of my best friends in the world. We take turns. Um, I was about to say every month, but it's just whenever we finish the books. Uh, I pick a book off of his TBR list, and he picks a, picks a book off of my TBR list. This is one that I picked off of his list. Um, John Ronson is perhaps best known for the book Men Who Stare at Goats. He's a British journalist, kind of a science writer. He writes about all sorts of weird phenomena, and he is funny. This is certainly the funniest book that I read this month. If you can imagine a book about psychopaths being funny, it is. It sort of uses um, the test that's used, the hair psychopathy checklist, which is a, like a 30-item checklist that's supposed to diagnose psychopathy. It sort of uses that test as a proxy, um, following the history of that test as a proxy for our understanding of um, psychopathy or sociopathy, however you want to say it, um, in general. And I thought that was really clever. Um, because the history of the test itself is relatively easy to trace and leads into all sorts of fun anecdotes. And I, and I think approaching it like that gave him a clear structure for a book that might otherwise have been too difficult and rambling. Anyway, this was a lot of fun. Um, another really quick read. Then I read, well, I'm kind of, kind of going in reverse chronological order here, but then I read um, uh, Jenny Isbell and Brent Bill's Finding God in the Verbs. These are a couple of Quaker authors. I'm a Quaker. Um, and they're writing a book on prayer. This ended up being not entirely for me. Um, it's all about vocal prayer and or prayer using words and how to engage in that more deeply. And I thought it was really, really well done for that. My problem is I don't really do vocal prayer. I'm a very, I do meditation and I do centering prayer. I'm a very wordless prayer kind of girl. Um, and so there was just a lot of stuff in here that I couldn't use for my own spiritual practice. However, that didn't make it a bad book. I feel like if you're somebody that does use vocal prayer, you would really get a lot out of this. It sort of took vocal prayer and broke it down in almost a writing workshop style. And I think that's a really useful technique to bring to bear on prayer. So I read that. And then last, actually first, I read B.S. Naipaul's Among the Believers in Islamic Journey. You might notice a theme here. I'm really interested in issues of like faith and belief and psychology. This I did not end up liking at all. Um, V.S. Naipaul won the Nobel Prize in Literature, and so one would imagine that um, it is well written, and indeed it is very well written. There are some beautiful prose passages in here, but I found him super condescending um, towards the people he was talking about and not really engaged in actually understanding what they were saying. There's this big culture gap between Nepal, um, who is uh, a Trinidadian-born British citizen, if I remember correctly, um, and the and the Muslims that he was in contact with, and he never really seemed to work on bridging that gap, or he did so only superficially. Um, he had just very different basic assumptions from the people that he was speaking to. He never was able to parse out, oh, well, they have this basic assumption that's different from my basic assumption. That's why they're saying this thing that doesn't make sense to me. And I found that really frustrating. I mean, he's clearly a really smart guy. Dude won the Nobel Prize, and yet he had this basic lack of an ability to um, deconstruct his own basic assumptions. And that really spoiled the book for me. 
Next, speculative fiction. I read four books that I would describe as speculative fiction in the month of March. Um, three of them were in ebook. Actually, two of them were in ebook form, but I've got three library cards here because one I already got rid of. <laughs> I didn't like it very much. Um, and then one I can show you a copy of. But I read, I'm going to do the worst one first. This book was so bad. It was free on the Kindle and I was sick at home. So I downloaded this totally free ebook and it was wretched. Wretched! Ugh! This should teach me about downloading free fantasy novels on the Kindle um, when I am bored and think I want to be entertained. I almost don't want to tell you what the name of it is because I hated it so much. But just to warn you off, it was The Book of Deacon by Joseph Lalo. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I feel bad. But it was bad. It just was. The main character was a Mary Sue and the plot was thin and the world building was wretched and the prose was just so awful. Like he never discussed, a sword was never a sword, it was a glorious blade or a frightening implement or an injurious tool or like something. It was just never a sword. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> then I read. <laughs> Uh, then I read the Doomsday Book by Connie Willis. This is the first in the Oxford uh, Time Travelers series. The conceit here is that it is kind of the near future. I think it's like 2050, 2060, and we've learned, figured out how to time travel. Um, and there's, it's all done, in, it's very academic, it's in academia, and historians go back in time very carefully um, so they don't create paradoxes. They go back in time dressed in period clothing after training a huge amount in what the period is like so they can blend in, they go back into this period and then they can write reports on what they actually find there. And so this is about the first the first historian that goes back to the medieval period and it cuts back and forth between her friends and professors back at home in Oxford and then her um, adventures or misadventures as it were um, in medieval England and it is it was great um, I didn't think it was particularly brilliant I thought perhaps it could have been pushed a little more however I read it when I was retching every hour or so um, because of the aforementioned stomach bug, and I feel like that unfairly jaundiced my opinion on the book. Because now I can't think about the book without feeling vaguely nauseous, which clearly has nothing to do with the quality of the book at all whatsoever. So if you're interested in time travel and you like like geeky school stories, then I think this would be a hit for you. Um, and then the last library card here is I have I read Half Resurrection Blues by Daniel Jose Older. This is a book I never ordinarily would have picked up myself, but it was in my my Book Riot quarterly shipment. I I subscribed to the Book Riot quarterly box. I didn't end up liking this book either. I was hoping I would because it sounded like so much fun and so outside of what I would ordinarily do. Um, the idea is that uh, the main character who's name I have entirely forgotten. That's how well I remember it, um, was half resurrected. He's not fully dead nor fully alive, um, which gives him certain advantages in this, um, in this sort of alternate New York City where, you know, ghosts and witches and all sorts of creatures are, are real and wandering around and wreaking havoc. And, you know, there's like the classic sort of end of the world scenario and he has to bail them out. It was just and, like, I'm really done with the classic end-of-the-world scenarios, and I was not super compelled by this one in particular, and I didn't think the plotting was very compelling, and I found some of the characters kind of eye-rolly, but... All right, then the last bit of speculative fiction I read, this was a lot more fun, Madeline Lengel's A Wrinkle in Time graphic novel format. This just came out as a graphic novel like a few days ago, and I ran immediately out and bought it. Um, Wrinkle in Time was one of my favorite books when I was little, and I like graphic novels, and so I thought I would check this one out. Here, I'll show you some of the artwork. It is, it's lovely. I, I mean, there's not too much bad I can say about A Wrinkle in Time, except one thing I'll say about A Wrinkle in Time in the graphic novel format is that, is that, you know, it's kind of a cheesy book, which... I didn't realize, obviously, when I read it in third grade, and then rereading it as an adult, I can be like, oh, that's cheesy, but the cheesy bits are kind of, like, slid into the dialogue. But in the graphic novel format, like, the cheesy punchline sort of bits are, like, popped out, and they'll all be in their own little box, and you're like, oh, my God, that's so cheesy. So I feel like it's cheesier as a graphic novel than it is as a novel novel, but 
I don't know. I, I have there's such a soft spot in my heart for this book. I'm I'm so happy that I got it. I'm just really this was such a, such a pleasing experience. I read it all in one sitting. In fact, I went to the bookstore and then I went out to my car to drive home and I was so excited to read it. I like sat in my car and like read the first two or three chapters. Like that was how excited I was about this book. Oh my god, this is getting long. Oh, so I read six books of poetry in March. No, I read four. Four <laughs> books of poetry in March. One of them I've already gotten rid of. I never read poetry in ebook. I just I cannot I cannot do it. Um, so one of them I've already passed on because I don't like it. Um, but it was the last two seconds by Mary Jo Bang. Um, it just wasn't my kind of poetry. It was a little. It was too ab too abstract. It was clever. It was well done. And I'm, I'm not going to say it was bad poetry because it wasn't. But it was not my thing. It was all about carefully constructing um, these little perfect jewel boxes of words to get lovely effects, but the effects weren't spectacular enough to really make up for how abstract and sort of academic the construction of the poem was. And I didn't find them beautiful. Like, I found them clever, and I found them thoughtful, but I did not find them pleasurable and I did not find them I did not find myself like wanting to emulate her style at all. I guess that's all I have to say about that. Um, and then this one I, I reviewed at greater length in um, another video, but this is The Seven Last Words by Terry Minshaw Prophet. This is a lovely little chapbook. Um, it's really appropriate for this week. Um, I'm filming this during Holy Week. Um, this is all about the seven last words of Christ on the cross. And it is bound up with some really beautiful artwork, which I've showed before, but I'll show again because that's how lovely it is. Um, and I know, it's just a lovely little chat book. Um, and then two more that I read this month um, were I read, I just picked this up with, off a used shelf at Barnes & Noble, um, Among Angels by Nancy Willard and Jane Yolen. Jane Yolen is better, more known as a fantasy author for children, which is how I knew her. And I saw this and I said, oh, I love Jane Yolen when I was little. I didn't know she wrote poetry. I picked it up and she writes pretty decent poetry. Um, you would expect a collection of poetry about angels to be really terrible and cheesy, but it, it wasn't at all. Um, there were some delightful lines in here, and it is another reason I bought it is because it was also bound up with artwork. This is the sort of thing. We're not talking. Whoop. We're not talking cheesy angel art here. We're talking some really neat-looking stuff. And then the last one that I read, which I adored, so good. Um, and this may may not be one of my all-time favorite poetry collections, but this is Anne Sexton's Transformations. It is amazing, amazing. It won the Pulitzer Prize for poetry back in the day, which isn't always a great, the greatest marker for whether I'm going to like it, but in this case, oh dear God, so well deserved. These are all fairy tale retellings, and they are amazing. One of the things that I like so much about this was insects has such a, a facility for simile. I love the comparison she makes as still as a gold piece. I remember um, as something as parsnips was one really unexpected one. Love grew around her like crabgrass, as anonymous as a urinal. Anyway, this was just a lovely, moving, frightening sort of collection. Um, and this is a great addition. The foreword is by Kurt Vonnegut, and it is bound with, again, artwork, which I always really enjoy. Oh, this is, this is maybe my favorite illustration in the whole thing. This is from The Wonderful Musician. There we go. Yeah, this, is, this was just delightful. And last, I read only two books of literary fiction in March, which is really disappointing because I like literary fiction, so I also have to read more in April to make up for it. I read um, W. Somerset Mom's The Painted Veil, which I reviewed at greater length um, back in my March TBR video. Um, but this was a great book. I, this is the first mom I'd ever read, and I was really excited to read it and realize how much I'm going to love mom. So I've got the whole rest of his oeuvre to read, and that's pretty exciting. And then I reread Mrs. Dalloway, which is one of my very favorite books. Um, I have a couple editions. This is the one that I read or reread. This is Mrs. Dalloway bound up with a bunch of essays on Mrs. Dalloway, some of which I read, some of which I didn't read. But whatever. Uh, Mrs. Dalloway is just a fantastic, gorgeous book. Um, and I had a lot of fun this time going through my copy and marking it up. 
Um, I love to mark up books. I am a book marker upper. Um, <laughs> you can see my love for Mrs. Dalloway in my notes and highlights here. I just couldn't stop. I went through and page after page. I was like writing and highlighting and loving Mrs. Dalloway to pieces. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Oh, that's all. I, and I'll be back in a separate video with part two, my April TBR. <laughs>